Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. Christmas is coming, and so we are talking about the characters of Christmas. If I can take you over here. Last week, if you saw our show, we talked about the angel of Christmas. Today, we're going to talk about the shepherds. Next time, we're going to talk about the wise men. And then last, but certainly not least, we're going to talk about the Christ child. So today, let's learn all that we can from the shepherds. And let me just um, say this about shepherds. Shepherds in the first century Palestine were lowly, despised people. They were on the bottom of the social ladder. People thought they were so dishonest, a shepherd could not give evidence in court. But isn't it interesting, the first people that hear that Jesus is born were the shepherds. That means God goes for the lowly, the despised, the sinful. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Consider your calling, Christian brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, like shepherds, uh, things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So today let's talk about the lowly, the despised, probably the pretty ignorant shepherds, and let's learn from them. Let's pray. Father, we pray for anyone watching this show that thinks they're too evil or too uh, poor or unintelligent or wicked to be your followers. Teach us now, Lord, that you go for those people and speak to us about the shepherds. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn your Bible to probably the most famous story on earth, Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 8. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. <laughs> Here's the first lesson. God's glory causes fear. I won't go into details, but there's been a very few times in my life where I think I've kind of experienced the, the power, the glory of God. It scared me to death. And for years after that, I, I would pray before I'd go to bed at night, Lord, you don't need to visit me tonight because <laughs> the glory of the Lord is it's awesome, frightening. But then look at the next verse, verse 10. And the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not. Here's the next lesson. God does not want us to fear. The angels get afraid. The angel says, don't. Now, that leads to the question, are we supposed to fear God? Well, this will take some explaining, but follow this. Proverbs 9 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You're smart to fear God. And then in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, disciples, don't fear people. All they can do is kill you. Fear God, who after he's killed you, can send you to hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So it's a good thing to fear God. It's smart. Um, but then right after Jesus says that in Luke chapter 12 about fearing God, he says this. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Not one of them is forgotten before God. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. So in the same paragraph, Jesus says, fear God because it can send you to hell. And then fear not, you're more valuable to God, to God than the sparrow. So what's going on here? Are we supposed to fear God or not? And the answer is yes, both. <laughs> it's kind of like this. If I'm driving in my car, 
I'm normally not afraid. Up and down the hills, take the curves. But if my tire starts going over the curb, down into the ditch, I get scared and I get back on the road. That's the Christian life. If I'm following Christ, trusting Christ, I'm not afraid. But if I start turning away from Christ, if I start living in sin, then I should be so scared I get back on the road because Jesus said, Luke 12, God can send you to hell. So fear not, trust Christ, follow Christ. When you sin, get his forgiveness and you're fine. But if you turn away from Christ, your only source of salvation, you should be scared to death so you get back on the road. You know, I could do a whole year's TV shows on the fear nots of the Bible. I think overwhelmingly, Christian, God doesn't want you to fear unless you're going down into that ditch. Come back to the Lord. Verse 10 again, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. The angel says to the shepherds, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Here's the next lesson. Jesus brings great joy. Don't be one of these Christians who walks around like you're sucking on a lemon. <laughs> so I got a phone call. Pastor Brock, I saw your TV show. You are a false prophet. Okay, madam, why is that? Well, you don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And you practice baby baptism. So you're a false prophet. And she went on and I thought... Lady, can I have a little grace? I mean, can somebody disagree with you on something biblical and still be saved? <laughs> I mean, we got to give some people some wiggle room. And don't be one of these Christians who's bitter and angry if people don't agree with you on everything. Or, or uh, No, listen, Christianity is good news of great joy. Think of the early Christians. The early Christians were persecuted, thrown to the lions for their faith. But it says this in, 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 in the Bible. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. So either even under persecution, the early Christians had joy. So, do you have joy right now? If you don't, can I tell you what to do? <laughs> J-O-Y. You put Jesus first, others second, yourself third. J-O-Y. And that's where we get joy. So if you don't have much joy in your life, put Jesus first. Put others before yourself. Put yourself third and see what happens. <laughs> Verse 10. I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all the people. Here's the next lesson. Jesus is for everyone. He's not just for the Jews. He's not for, he's for everybody. Gentiles, unbelievers, atheists, Buddhists, Hindus. Um, Jesus is for absolutely everybody. And there's a terrible heresy now in some of our more liberal Protestant churches that teach that you don't need Jesus. I mean, it go, it, here's the way it goes. It's a little more insidious than that. We should leave the natives alone. They have their own religions. Now, Christ is good for Christians, and we believe in Christ, but, you know, don't impose your religion. You know, don't take your missionaries and send them to Asia. Just let the Asians have Buddha and, and, and Krishna, and, and Christians will have... That's an evil heresy. People who think they're doing people a favor by withholding Jesus from them don't get it. I mean, I've shared on this show before, I'm a Lutheran, I used to be an ELCA Lutheran. The head bishop of the ELCA Lutheran Church was asked by a Chicago newspaper, Bishop Eaton, is there a hell? Her response, there may be, but I think it's empty. Her belief is everybody ends up in heaven. Well, if that's true, let's bring the missionaries home. And they're doing it. The United Methodists, the Episcopalians, the uh, United Church of Christ, the Presbyterian Church USA, the ELCA Lutherans, they used to have a lot more missionaries, not anymore. Now, I left the ELCA Lutheran Church and joined a more biblical branch of Lutheranism many years ago. But somehow, this last week, in the mail, the ELCA found me, and they sent me a 24-page booklet on how to give good Christmas gifts through the ELCA. And here's the thing, it's all fine. It's about, you know, buying somebody a goat in Africa or digging a well in Kenya. And it's all good, but one page is dedicated to sending Bibles for growing the church and putting a pastor on a motorbike. One page out of, I mean, 23 pages was nice stuff that atheists can do. 
But one page dedicated to spreading the gospel. They did have a sec, a not one more page, trying uh, making sure we have lots of women in the seminary, but which I don't believe in either. But ah, uh, listen, Jesus is good news of great joy for all the people, and we need to get him to all the people, and and not just do nice social stuff. Wouldn't it be great if 23 pages of this was evangelism and bringing lost souls to Christ? You don't hear about that in the ELCA. Verse 11, the angel says to the shepherds, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now that's an important verse. It has three important words I'm going to define. Savior, Christ, Lord. First the word Savior. The word Savior in that verse means that Jesus is a spiritual Savior, not a political Savior. The Jews were expecting a political savior to come and destroy Pontius Pilate, get rid of the Romans, and let Jerusalem be the kingdom of the Jews. Uh, that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to be our spiritual savior to save us from our real bigger enemies, sin, death, and the devil. Now, there will be a time at the second coming when Jesus does become a political savior. He comes down from heaven and sits up, sets up his kingdom and rule over all uh, the universe. That will happen politically even. But no, the first coming, he came as our uh, spiritual savior. The next word, Christ. The word Christ is not Jesus' last name. Joseph and Mary Christ did not have a baby and call him Jesus Christ. No, when you say the words Jesus Christ, that's a title. You're saying Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus is the Christ. What is Christ? Christ is from the Old Testament. It literally means anointed one. The Old Testament prophesied an anointed one would come and save the Jews. So the word Christ means anointed one. Again, he saves us not from the Romans. He saves us from our big enemies, sin, death, and the devil. Then the next word, Lord. The word Lord means two things. First, it means God. The word Lord means God. Now, here's what's fascinating. In Luke chapters 1 and 2, the word Lord appears 25 times. Each time, it, it refers to the Old Testament Jehovah God. But here in verse 11, it refers to Jesus, meaning Jesus is Jehovah God. He's the God of the Old Testament. Um, now, can you deny that Jesus is God and be a Christian? I don't think so, which is why I think the Jehovah's Witnesses are in trouble. To be a Christian, you have to believe Jesus is God. The second thing the word Lord means is master. Every Roman uh, slave had a master. There were lots of Christians that were slaves in the first century. They all had a master. When you say Jesus is Lord, you mean he's my God, but you also mean he's my master, I'm his slave, I do what he tells me. You've got to have both to be a Christian. So let me give you the definition of a Christian. A Christian is someone who believes Jesus is God and who has Jesus master of their life. Let me repeat that. A Christian is someone who believes two things. He's my God, but he's also my master. You've got to have them both because Satan believes Jesus is God, but he doesn't let him be master of his life. There are lots of people who know intellectually Jesus is God, but does, do they let him touch their life? No. To be saved, to be a Christian, you believe he's God and you let him be master of your life. Not that you do that perfectly, we all still sin, but he's generally the Lord and ruler of your life. And look at verse 12. The angel says to the shepherds, This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, here's the next lesson, there are, there are armies of angels. The word host, heavenly host, you know what the word host means? It means an army. And listen to this from uh, Revelation 5. 
Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myri of myriads and thousands of thousands. In other words, there's lots of angels. In fact, my guess is you've probably met an angel without knowing it because Hebrews 13, excuse me, Hebrews 12 says that they uh, can look like hu normal humans. There's lots of them. <laughs> Uh, look at verse 14. Here's what the angels are saying. Glory to God in the highest. Here's the next lesson. Jesus came to earth to glorify God. You know, normally we think Jesus came to earth to save us. Well, that's true. Hallelujah. But even maybe bigger, he came to earth to glorify God. We, don't, we need to think about that more and not be so man-centered. The reason Jesus came to earth was to save us so that we would glorify God. And then look at the rest of verse 14. The angel says, glory to God, and on earth peace among those with whom God is pleased. Maybe a better definition or translation. Peace among those who are objects of God's good pleasure. Kind of a hint of predestination there. So here's the next lesson. Jesus does not bring peace to everyone. He brings peace to those of his good pleasure. And... and Jesus himself would, would, would clear this up. He said this in Matthew chapter 10. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So yes, Jesus brings peace on earth. We sing about that at Christmas, but not to everybody. He only brings peace to those who are of his good pleasure, the believers. Every year, if you go to Epcot and Disney World, Epcot puts on this big Christmas pageant, and it's beautiful. I went one year. They sing Christian, it's a huge choir. They sing Christmas carols. Uh, they have a celebrity get up and read the, uh, the Christmas story. It was wonderful. Well, the year I happened to go, the celebrity to get up was Eartha Kitt, Catwoman from Batman. <laughs> she has since died. But she got up and read the Christmas story and then she said, well, no matter what religion you are, the, the meaning of Christmas is in the words of Rodney King. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> and I sat there thinking, no, Eartha, that is not the meaning of Christmas. The meaning of Christmas is that God has come to earth, become a human being. He died on the cross, rose from the dead. And those who trust him, who follow him, he, they're forgiven of their sins and they're of his good pleasure. But if you reject him, you're not going to get peace in this life or the next. Peace among those of God's good pleasure is what it says. Verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Here's the next lesson. You must obey God's word to get the blessing. I mean, what would have happened if the shepherds would have said, Well, we just suffered a mass hallucination. We're not going to Bethlehem. They would have missed the blessing. And what I learned from the shepherds is, Christian, you have to not just hear God's word, you have to obey God's word to get the blessing. For instance, I think it'd be a great New Year's resolution for you to say, I'm going to read the Bible every day the rest of my life. Now you can ignore that, a lot of people do, but you'll miss the blessing. Or here's another New Year's resolution. I'm going to start giving God 10% of my money. I'm going to start tithing. Now you can ignore that. A lot of people do, but you miss the blessing. Well, let me give you another one. The Bible says if you're a Christian, you marry a Christian. And you can ignore that. A lot of people do, and they end up missing the blessing of having a Christian marriage. Uh, one more. The Bible says obey your parents and you'll live longer. A lot of people ignore that and they die early. So the point of the shepherds is it's not enough to hear what to do. You get blessed when you obey the word of God. So let me ask you this question. <laughs> what has God been tugging on your heart to do lately and you just haven't done it? I want to encourage you to get the joy, to get the blessing. Just do it. Verse 16. And they went away with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they, the shepherds, made known 
the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Here's the next lesson. God uses the lowest to evangelize people. Remember, these shepherds were kind of nobodies on the bottom of the social rung. Who are the first people to proclaim Jesus to another human being? It was the shepherds. <laughs> and, and listen, um, I want to encourage you, never think like this. Well, I don't, I'm not smart enough to talk to that person about Jesus, or I'm so sinful, I'm not holy enough to talk to him. No, no, listen, Christian, God wants every Christian to share the gospel with others. Satan will throw at you all these reasons to shut up. But listen, let's give Satan a coronary this Christmas. Let's open our mouth and talk to people about Jesus Christ. Verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Have you ever wondered, where did Luke, who was not at the Christmas scene, he wasn't born yet, how did Luke know about all this stuff? Well, some scholars think, and I think it's probable, he says here, he's giving a hint, Mary treasured all these things. And, he, and Luke says at the beginning of his gospel, I investigated all this. He probably sat down and had an interview with Mary to get his source material for this. Could be. Verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising him for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Here's the last lesson. Jesus causes us to glorify God. If you remember, the reason he was born was to glorify God. Well, it's working. Here the shepherds start glorifying God. And um, Christian, do you know why you're on earth? Same reason. Here's what it says in Isaiah 43. Everyone who was called by my name, I created for my glory. The reason God put you on earth is the same reason he put Jesus on earth. It's to glorify him. So let me just close the sermon now and ask you this question. Are you glorifying God in your life? Do you have anything you do to serve the Lord to glorify him? Can I just close? I'm, I'm going to ask you to do one of three things to start glorifying God. Choose one of these. Number one, I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. Just, just make that a, a choice. Or do number two, I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to start giving God my money. Or number three, is there some volunteering or some, something you can do to use your gifts, your talents, to glorify God and bring others to Christ? That is why God put Jesus on earth. That's why God put you on earth, to glorify God. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Mm -hmm. Pastor Brock, is tithing required of New Testament Christians? Good question. Now we just talked about tithing and do you as a Christian have to give 10% of your salary to the Lord? Well, I will say it's not required of New Testament Christians. Never in the, Bible, in the New Testament are Christians required. In fact, slaves couldn't have done it if they wanted to, and a lot of early Christians were slaves. But Mona, I'll say this, <laughs> if the Old Testament Jews mm -hmm. who knew this much about the love of God were to be moved to give 10% to support God in the temple, we New Testament Christians who know this much since the cross about the love of God, Will we be inspired to give more or less mm -hmm. than the Old Testament Jews? So I think, especially in America, where we are rich mm -hmm. compared to the rest of the world, everybody at least give 10% to the Lord. Give it to your church, give it to missionaries, but I like to give my 10% to my local church, but then my offerings, which are above the 10%, I love to give to missions and, and, and that kind of thing. So is it required? No. Uh, should we be doing that and more so? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> How do you choose some of those organizations to give to? I, there's something called Charity Navigator. Okay. Just, just Google the words Charity Navigator and it'll show you which Christian ministries are on the up and up and which ones to avoid. Awesome. Again, I would not give money to these people on TV, TV preachers who tell you if you send me money, you're going to get a ch some lady in Atlanta mm -hmm. got $40,000 the next day after she gave us $400. Mm -mm. Right. Yeah. Got to be choosy. Yeah, absolutely. If I decide to begin reading my Bible daily, where do you suggest I begin? Yeah, I hope people take seriously what I said about start reading your Bible every day. Mm -hmm. And I think you can start with Genesis chapter 1 and just go through it. 
maybe a little better is start with Matthew chapter 1, go all the way through the New Testament, then start with Genesis, go all the way through the Old, and then just do that the rest of your life. Just yeah, I've read the Bible through many times and I'm still going through it right now in the Old Testament. Yeah. I want to serve God, but how do I know where God wants me to serve? Mm -hmm. we, like we heard in the sermon, you glorify God when you serve Him. All right, how do I know where to serve Him? Mm -hmm. Well, you got to pray and ask, Lord, what are my gifts? What am I good at? Mm -hmm. And Mona, I'm not good at finances. Don't put me in charge of the finances of your church unless you want it to go under. <laughs> but I know how to preach, so that's where I serve. Mona, if your gift is uh, hospitality, then the Lord will use you in that sphere. But if your gift is not, we'll say, um, uh, teaching, then you don't go there. So find out what your gifts are and then use that in some way to serve the Lord. And if you try it and you don't like it, there's always others. And, and all, Yes, there are. And also mm -hmm. one way to find out what your gift is, ask people. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think I'm good at? And then serve the Lord that way. Yeah. Awesome. Any advice on how to share Christ with others during the Christmas season? Yeah. Um, I... Uh, I don't know if you're, you used to go to the church that I served for many mm -hmm. years, but we used to put a gospel tract, a Christmas tract, in the bulletin. And we would tell people, read this before you have your Christmas meal, or read this before you open presents. And it was just a quick little gospel message on why Christ came to earth. And you can go to any Christian bookstore, or easier, go online and type in uh, Christmas tracts, T-R-A-C-T-S, Mm -hmm. and get get a few of them, read them, give them out, g put it inside the present when you give presents to people. That's mm -hmm. the way to keep Christ the center of, of Christmas. Don't you think sometimes it's the fear of what if I don't say the right thing? Yeah, but we got to get over that. We do. Yeah, even if you say the wrong thing, God can use it. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Well, we only have 21 seconds. Oh, okay. So I just want to thank you for joining us today on the pastor study, and God bless you, and until we meet again next week. Yeah, and I'll add this. we got 10 seconds. Everybody, if you go to pastorstudy.org, you can watch all of our TV shows for yeah. free. So send people to pastorstudy.org. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. If you've been blessed by The Pastor Study, would you consider a tax-deductible gift to help us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ? You can donate at our website, pastorstudy.org, two S's, or mail a check to the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55441. May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful week.